talk more now about um, uh, systemic metastatic disease. Um, and we're really lucky to have Melinda, Dr. Melinda Ushak with us um, from the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University to talk about this. Um, and I just wanted to highlight what I just mentioned over here to your question and just remind everybody that we also have a session, a panel tomorrow morning um, from other colleagues at Emory who um, use targeted therapies, so like ablation, different liver directed treatments to the liver and outside the liver who can talk about those sorts of targeted treatments. So this is really from a systemic medical perspective, um, but those other treatments will be discussed more tomorrow morning. I think you refer to that in your talk too. So thank you, Dr. Yushak. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here today with everyone. Um, so, so like she said, I'm a medical oncologist at Emory, so I'm gonna be talking about things kind of from a systemic point of view. So first, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some basic terminology that we as medical oncologists often use. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about just some of the basics of clinical trials, because clinical trials are really an important point, and I'm gonna be talking a lot about different options for clinical trials, because we really need to learn about new treatments. And then I'm gonna talk finally about different treatment options that are available, and I'm gonna focus on a lot of the open clinical trials currently. My talk is gonna focus on mainly two big areas, targeted therapy and then immunotherapy. So first, when we as medical oncologists talk about metastatic disease, we often use that interchangeably with stage four disease. So that basically means that some cancer cells have left the original area where they started in the eye and they have traveled to some distant point in the body. Now, metastatic disease can be discovered either through surveillance or if people develop new symptoms or say they get into a car accident and they have a scan, they may find a new lesion and then their doctors will then suggest further workup. Now, whenever a new diagnosis of metastatic disease is made, we often want to do a biopsy. And that biopsy is to confirm what we're gonna be treating. So to confirm that it's ocular melanoma and then also to learn about some of the tumor characteristics because that might affect your treatment down the road. Now for ocular melanoma, over 90% of patients who develop metastatic disease eventually have disease in the liver. Um, however, it can go to other areas. The other most common areas include the lung, um, can also go to lymph nodes, into skin. It can essentially go everywhere, but mainly goes to the liver. So why would someone want to participate in a clinical trial if they have metastatic disease? Well, I think we've hit on a lot of these topics already. So ocular melanoma is very rare. Therefore, there are a lot of things that we don't completely understand. And there are a lot of improvements that we want to continue to make in how we treat patients with it. Clinical trials, they also, they also offer more options for patients. So things that are not yet FDA approved but look very promising may be available to you in a clinical trial setting. And then also, whenever you participate in a clinical trial, you are getting access to different drugs, but you're also kind of giving people down the road more information on which to base their treatment decisions. So what's involved in a clinical trial? It's often impo very important to realize that clinical trials have very strict rules. So in order to give experimental medications or different doses than we might normally use, there are often a certain set of guidelines that the doctors who are taking care of you in a clinical trial have to follow. And those rules often can't be bended too much. So that's just important to know. So for instance, if you have to get a treatment every two weeks, you really often have to get it every two weeks. You can't you know, skip six weeks unless there's a, a medical indication to do so. And also, each trial has its own set of rules. We call this the eligibility criteria. So for some trials, if you have other certain medical issues, you may not be able to participate in those trials. And really, the best way to know about which trials might be right for you is by speaking with physicians at the local sites, because they can tell you more of the specifics. And one thing, although I'm stressing a lot about clinical trials, I, I don't want people to, to leave here thinking that they absolutely have to participate in a clinical trial. Because there are other options, and it might be that a clinical trial isn't right for you. 
So I just kind of want you to know that there are options outside of clinical trials, even though that's kind of what I'm, I'm focusing on today. So first, let me just go into some of the terminology about different types of clinical trials. So a phase one trial, what does that mean? So usually a phase one trial involves a smaller number of patients. Generally, this is a trial that the goal of the trial is to determine that a medication is safe in the proper dose that we should be using. We can also learn other information like how effective the, the medication is, but again, remember, it's a very small number of patients who usually participate in phase one trials. So if a drug looks very promising in a phase one trial and it's safe, meaning people don't have severe side effects, then often that gets advanced to a phase two trial. Now in a phase two trial, the experimental drug is usually given to a larger number of patients. And the goal of the phase two trial is to see how effective it is. Sometimes if a drug is very promising in a phase two trial, it then goes to a phase three trial. This is often a much larger number of patients who are in it, and sometimes there are also different arms in a study, which can also happen in a phase two trial too. But, but what I mean by that is there can be one group who gets a standard drug, and then another group that gets the experimental drug. So now I'm going to just shift gears and start talking about some of the treatment options. Um, so like she said, tomorrow there's going to be a session on liver-directed therapies, so I'm just very briefly going to mention that because that's a very important role of how we take care of patients, but I'm going to leave all the specifics to tomorrow. I'm going to focus mainly on targeted therapies and immunotherapies. So first, before I start, I just want to say that all treatments are really individualized. Sometimes they're a combination of systemic treatment combined with targeted therapies. Sometimes it's just a targeted therapy, or sometimes it's a systemic therapy. And again, clinical trials, they're always dependent upon the availability, the eligibility, um, and the data that I'm presenting about what trials are available are available as of today. However, if some of the clinical trials fill up in a month from now, it may be a different story. And also, I'm only presenting ocular-specific trials. Um, there are other trials that some patients may be eligible for that treat lots of different types of cancers, but I'm really focusing on just the ocular melanoma trials. So first, liver-directed therapies. So this is some of the terminology that you're going to hear about tomorrow. So sometimes when patients have isolated disease in the liver, we can treat them with surgery, although that's kind of fallen out of favor. Um, another option is something called selective internal radiation therapy, or CERT therapy. So this is actually using radioactive microspheres to actually treat a specific area in the liver. And there's also something called taste therapy or transarterial chemoembolization, which is using chemotherapy to treat another spot lesion in the liver. And then lastly, hepatic artery infusion. So this is a procedure that will be described in detail tomorrow, but essentially it's using a chemotherapy agent to treat the disease within the liver, but it does not treat the rest of the body, and it'll be described a little bit more tomorrow. So again, sometimes local therapies to the liver are actually a very good option for some patients. It can treat the areas in the liver, but an important point to think about is that it doesn't treat disease anywhere else. So if someone has disease in the lung, it may not be the best option, or it might need to be combined with some sort of systemic therapy. So now on to targeted therapies. So targeted therapies act on a specific molecular targets that are associated with cancer, whereas most standard chemotherapies act on all rapidly dividing normal and cancerous cells. Targeted therapies are deliberately chosen or designed to interact with their target, whereas many standard chemotherapies were identified because they kill cells. Targeted therapies are often cytostatic, that is, they're um, blocking cell proliferation, they aren't necessarily um, cytotoxic, meaning that they actually directly kill the cancer cells. Now, there are lots of terms that we use for targeted therapy. You may have heard about 
um, some of these when, when just reading in the news media or other things. Molecularly targeted drugs, um, molecularly targeted therapies, also precision medicine or personalized medicine. So this is just a schematic of a cell here. This is the nucleus, which contains all the DNA material. This is the cell membrane kind of going along here. And what a cell does, so like let's suppose this is a cancer cell, it has these different receptors that essentially go inside the cell, so inside the cytoplasm, and they stick out kind of into the extracellular space here. And these pink balls here are different growth factors or different signals, which then they fit nicely into these receptors, and then they stimulate a signaling cascade, which basically tells a cell to do something. The goal of the targeted therapy is to block this process. So this is just another diagram of it, kind of close up. So this is that extracellular fluid here. This is a cell membrane. And this is one of the receptors, which kind of lays in between. So here we have this signaling molecule, which then goes, hooks up with the receptor. And then this stimulates signal transduction, which is basically telling all of these molecules within the cell <coughs> to do something. And often in a cancer cell, this results in the cell growing, it proliferating, it moving, doing all sorts of things that we don't want a cancer cell to do. So that was a simple diagram. In reality, this is actually very complicated. And I just kind of put this up there just to highlight that. So this is actually even a more simplified diagram than some others out there. But this is, again, the cell membrane here. And these are just all different receptors, which kind of happen. Um, and they're all working simultaneously. And these are all some of the signaling pathways kind of down here going into the cell nucleus. Now, in reality, this picture back here just showed kind of this nice straight line. But in reality, all of these cells, there's some crosstalk in between all of these pathways. But when we're talking about all of these targeted therapies, what we're doing is we're talking about blocking some of these pathways. So in cutaneous melanoma, we often talk about BRAF mutations. So about 50% of patients who have cutaneous melanoma have a BRAF mutation. And that's very important because if those patients have a BRAF mutation, they can actually have a targeted therapy called a BRAF inhibitor. Now, um, and Dibrafenib and trametinib and vemurafenib and cobimetinib are different medication combinations that are approved for people who have these BRAF mutations. Now, in ocular melanoma, very rare to have a BRAF mutation. However, as we heard earlier, there's actually ocular melanoma has a high rate of GNAQ and GNA11 mutations. Now, there are clinical trials in the works looking at targeting these mutations, but as of yet, there's no kind of equivalent to what we have in cutaneous melanoma. So the first drug that I'm going to talk about that's in clinical trials is something called uh, cabozantinib. So it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So basically, it hits several different of these um, receptors in the signaling transduction pathway. It's taken as an oral drug. It's currently in a phase two randomized trial. And, and at the end of all these slides, I have a list of everything. So if people want to write stuff down, they can just wait till the end, or I can email out um, some of the information. The phase two randomized trial means that some of the people will be getting this drug, and then other people will be getting what we consider a standard of care drug, which in this trial is something called timazolamide or dacarbazine. And it's randomized, meaning you don't get to choose which arm you, you are in. Now, the common side effects of this medication include diarrhea, mouth sores, something called palmar plantar erythrodesisia, which basically means people can get um, sensitivity and redness on their palms and on their soles. And it can also lead to some, some blistering and callus formation, which can be painful. Um, fatigue, high blood pressure, decreased appetite, <coughs> and then some liver and blood count abnormalities. And although rare, there have been some severe bleeding and clotting risks associated with this medication. The next drug I'll talk about is something called LXS196. So this is an oral drug. 
It's um, in a phase one trial, meaning that um, they're starting with a low dose level and slowly increasing the level of the drug that they're giving. It's something called a protein kinase C inhibitor. So kind of right over here, that's where that is. So it's trying to work to block this signaling cascade right here. Now in cutaneous melanoma, how I talked about BRAF mutations, um, people have been using BRAF inhibitors combined with MEK inhibitors, so targeting two different areas in that signaling pathway. So a similar thing is also being used in ocular melanoma. So this is again a phase 1B trial. It combines um, AEB071 and BYL719, which are two different drugs. They're both oral, one you take twice a day and one you take once a day. And again, there, it's a phase one st study, so they're slowly increasing the doses of the medications. And so these two drugs are, again, a protein kinase C inhibitor, but then also it's a PI3 kinase inhibitor, which is just one of these other signaling pathways here. Um, the next drug, which we heard about earlier, actually, in a different setting, is something called Varinostat. So there's a phase two trial looking at patients with metastatic disease um, taking varinostat. So again, this is an oral drug. It's given twice a day for three days every week. And this is specifically aimed at patients who have a specific GNAQ or GNA11 mutation. So this drug is an HDAC inhibitor. Essentially, HDAC is involved in the expression of DNA. So we all have lots of DNA in our body, and not all of it is being used all the time. So whenever a cell wants to, um, say, copy their DNA to, to accomplish whatever cellular processes that they need to, they basically have to take the DNA, which is normally in this very tightly wound um, configuration, and it has to be unwound so then the DNA can replicate. Now, there's a fine balance between having the DNA coiled or very, very tightly um, wound up and being kind of open so then it can uh, replicate. So what happens is a tumor suppressor gene can be turned off um, when it's in this configuration. However, if you do use an HDAC inhibitor, which kind of prevents this from going back that way, essentially you leave uh, the DNA in this state, and if it happens to be a tumor suppressor gene, then you're turning that on essentially, so promoting tumor suppression. So common side effects, fatigue, diarrhea, nausea, taste changes, increased blood sugar, and then elevation in your um, kidney function, and you can also get a low platelet count from this medication. And again, I put up some of the side effects just so you know, but not everybody gets everything that I'm talking about. So, so now switching gears a little bit to immunotherapy, which I think a lot of people are very interested in. So we all know that the immune system is very, very important just in our daily lives. Um, it really helps our bodies defend against foreign invaders. So we use it on a regular basis to defend against bacteria, viruses, parasites, whatever things we come into contact with in our daily lives. The immune system is actually a very complicated system. There are several different kind of organs involved. We have the lymph nodes, the bone marrow, which um, produces um, you know, some of the white blood cells, and we have white blood cells that are kind of floating around in our bodies during the day. Now, there are a variety of cell types that are within the immune system, and this is just a schematic of some of the different types that we often use on a, on a regular basis to help kind of keep our, our cells healthy. Now, for cancer, I'm going to be focusing on kind of these over here, the B and the T cell. The B cells here are, in this schematic, are making antibodies. Now, antibodies are proteins that are normally produced by our body. They identify and they help neutralize threats. They're kind of shown usually in this Y-shaped configuration. And here at this end, they have what's called an antigen binding site. So antigen is basically a foreign protein, essentially, or something that the antibody can attach to. This can be something like bits of a tumor cell. It can also be something like bacteria, whatever it is that the body thinks it needs to recognize. So this is just how it normally works. Say you have a virus and you get exposed to it, 
the antibodies that have um, kind of recognized that virus can then latch onto it and then help your body kind of clear that out of your system. So it's kind of like a lock and key type system. Now a cancer cell, as we talked about before, has lots of different things kind of on its cell surface. Now some of these proteins may look very similar to kind of normal cells that you have, but some of them might be abnormal and they might be targets for a monoclonal antibody. So a type of antibody that is similar to the type your body produces but is manufactured in a lab and specifically targeted for one of these proteins on the cell. Now, the balance in the immune system is very, very important. So if you think about if your immune system is too active, you can risk the having what we call autoimmunity. So you can develop autoimmune disorders. So if your immune system is attacking your own body, you can develop things like type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and other, other issues. However, if it goes on the opposite end, so your immune system is not as active, not um, keeping surveillance as much as it should, you can be at risk for having bacterial infections. Now we know patients who have organ transplants and are on immunosuppressive medications, there are certain risks of, or increased risks that they may have of different types of cancers, and we think that's because their immune system is being suppressed, so therefore the immune system can't recognize those cancers as well and deal with them. So the immune system in cancer. So this is kind of a very hot topic nowadays. So there are lots of different ways that the immune system um, interacts with cancer. And cancer is very smart. And it kind of learns about different ways that it can kind of tell the immune system like, hey, don't worry about us, you know? Um, so, so one, cancer cells look similar to normal body cells. You know, so, so if you have those little antibodies kind of coming around, it might be like, hey, this is a sheep, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Oh. Um, other things that cancer cells can do is, your body has these normal processes where when a cell recognizes something that's foreign, there's a signal that, that, that goes to the cell saying like, okay, immune system, now you can turn off. You did your job, turn off. Well, cancer cells can kind of co-opt that. And essentially, your immune system is like, hey, everything's fine. I don't have to worry about it. I can stop. So that brings us to the, the topic of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is very unlike traditional chemotherapy. It's not cytotoxic. It's really trying to use the power of your immune system to really help control the cancer and to recognize it. And there are variety, when we say immunotherapy, that means lots of different things. That can mean um, vaccines, that can be injectable medications that contain things like monoclonal antibodies. It can mean lots of different things. So for melanoma, actually, um, there have been several medications approved for immunotherapy. And these are all monoclonal antibodies. So the first one, ipilimumab, was FDA approved in 2011. Nivolumab was um, just recently FDA approved, and that was followed by Pembrolizumab, which is approved in 2014. So the way these drugs work, so again, they're monoclonal antibodies. Over here, there's a tumor cell, and this is a T cell or immune cell system. And essentially what happens is the tumor cell, some of its um, proteins get, get kind of shown to the immune system, and this results in a positive signaling. So the immune system essentially gets activated. However, over time, what the tumor cell can do is release um, these receptors, which will come to the cell surface, and that can interact with um, receptors on the T cell, and that can dampen down the immune system. However, with these drugs, the goal is that that kind of blocks that interaction. So kind of put in another way, um, usually the, the tumor cells bind to T cells to deactivate them. So there's kind of like a stop. However, with immunotherapy, there's kind of a block there. Like they can't, they can't get together. And then what happens is the immune cell stays activated. So this has also been kind of referred to as um, immunotherapy is preventing the immune system from applying the breaks. So instead of saying like, hey, we can stop our immune response, let's keep going. 
So just a little bit about these drugs. And again, these drugs were all FDA approved. Um, the ipilimumab is an IV treatment. It's given once every three weeks. It's given for a total of four doses. And it's a monoclonal antibody, so it's an anti-CTLA-4 drug. The next one is nivolumab. This is also an IV treatment. It's given once every two to three weeks, and I'll explain that difference later. Um, it continues for up to two years, and this is um, one of the anti-PD-1 drugs. Now, um, IPI and NEVO can be combined with one another. So we think that the combination may actually be more beneficial than either one alone. Um, when we do combine them, we essentially give IPI and NEVO every three weeks for a total of four doses. And then at that point, we would plan to do a scan. And assuming that the treatment is going well and no significant side effects, what we would do is we would continue NEVO every two weeks for up to a total of two years. And again, this would be every 12 weeks or so, we would be doing scans to make sure that um, the your, your body is continuing to respond to the medication. And then pembrolizumab, so this is another anti-PD-1 drug. Um, it is given as a single agent. It's an IV treatment. It's given once every three weeks. And again, this can con continue for up to two years, although that may change as we learn more information. So some of the side effects. As you can imagine with that scale that we talked about, the balance between the immune system. When you have an overactive immune system or an immune system that's been revved up, you can essentially create almost like autoimmune disorders within your body. So these drugs aren't for people who have very severe autoimmune disorders. Um, it can cause significant toxicities. When we give IPI and NEVO together, that has a higher rate of having certain toxicities. So fatigue, um, you can get a rash. You can get various endocrinopathies. So what I mean by that is um, disorders of your thyroid um, hormones, also disorders of cortisol or other hormones. Um, it can cause diarrhea, and this can be life-threatening. It can be um, an inflammation of your bowel, similar to what we would see in an inflammatory bowel disease. It can also cause inflammation in essentially anywhere in your body, you know, your eye, your lung, your liver, your kidneys. That's why it has to be monitored very closely, and you have to report to your physician if you have any symptoms. Um, so as I said, these have been approved by the FDA. There have been several large trials in melanoma looking at these drugs and the effectiveness. However, in a lot of the initial studies, patients with ocular melanoma were excluded. So therefore, although we are currently treating patients with ocular melanoma, we can't give you the exact statistics saying, you know, X number of patients respond well to this drug. And that's why there are actually clinical trials ongoing looking at specifically people who have ocular melanoma. So there's a trial with a combination of IPI and NEVO, <laughs> specifically in patients with ocular melanoma. And there's also a trial looking at just PEMBRO in patients with ocular melanoma. So the next drug that I'm going to talk about, and this is shifting gears back to some of the clinical trial options. So this is um, Glembatumumab. So this is um, in a phase two trial. It's given as an IV treatment every three weeks. And it's basically something called an antibody drug conjugate. So essentially, you have this antibody, um, which is connected with this um, chemical compound right here. This is called MMAE, which essentially it is a, um, it's like a chemotherapy drug. What happens is this antibody will then attach to a cancer cell. Once that happens, this drug is delivered within the cell and actually results in cell death. So the next one that I'll talk about is something called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So this is a phase two trial. Currently, it's only available at NIH in um, DC. Essentially what it is, and I have a diagram on the next slide, but it's chemotherapy followed by um, infusion of these TIL cells. And then some of the patients in this trial will receive IL-2, which is another drug afterwards, and some patients won't. 
Now this is a very intensive uh, treatment. Most patients will actually be hospitalized who, who participate in this for about four weeks or so. So what happens is um, a surgeon or someone will excise a portion of the tumor. What they will do is once they've harvested that, they'll bring it to the lab and they'll try to culture some of the tumor cells and some of the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes essentially are certain white blood cells. And what they want to do is have certain white blood cells which will then recognize the tumor cells. So they try to culture these tills and they use it with a medication called IL-2 in, um, in the lab. They select for certain tills which will recognize specific um, tumor <coughs> antigens and then they, they grow those. And this whole process here of growing them can take weeks. That's why this technology, it's really only good for a certain select group of patients. Because remember, during this time, you may not be getting as intensive treatment. So once these have grown up, um, the person will then go into the hospital. They'll receive high doses of chemotherapy with the goal of essentially ablating um, or significantly decreasing a lot of your own normal circulating lymphocytes in your body. Once that's happened, these cells that have been grown will then be infused back into you. Now, half the patients will then get IL-2 therapy, which the goal of that is to stimulate your immune system more, and then the other half will just kind of be followed after getting the TIL infusion. So um, next topic that I'll talk about is a vaccine and an IDO inhibitor. So IDO is an enzyme that essentially promotes immune suppression and tolerance. Um, and some cancers have also been shown to overexpress IDO. Um, uh, vaccines have been around for a long time. The goal of vaccines is essentially to introduce, again, foreign protein, foreign antigen, which then can help stimulate an immune response. So these are given together. Um, the IDN IDO inhibitor is an oral pill that you take twice a day. The vaccine um, is given six different injections, usually into the arms, are given over a 98-day period. Um, and again, this, this can be extended as long as patients are tolerating it well. Um, here, actually, I've come to my summary slides. And this actually summarizes, so what I've done is, and we can send these out to you or you can take pictures of them, whatever you would like. Um, this is a clinicaltrials.gov identifying number for each of these trials along with the titles. So these are a summary of the immunotherapy trials here. And then this is a summary of some of the targeted therapies that I talked about. So I'd just like to thank everybody for listening um, and I'd like to thank the um, Cure OM for having this wonderful meeting. So I think it's great to have everyone get together and discuss different ideas. Um, Dr. Kujakar and Dr. Lawson are my colleagues at Emory. Um, so I'd like to thank them and then just everyone else at the melanoma team at Emory. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Could you tutor my son in biology? <laughs> um, my question is, is my husband's gotten through, he went through the Ipi Nevo, and now he's on, what are you on now? Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm confused because when they did his PET scan, they said, oh, the tumor is larger, but they weren't sure if that was, and then the PET scan, the uptake was less. And so I don't know how much faith, you know, we can put in that or what that means and then um, why they would do the uh, radio embolization, the mm -hmm. spheres. If, if, does that mean there's more of a problem that they want to do that, or is it just a good adjunct yep. therapy to the? Yep, no, so that brings up a couple of good points. So, so one for immunotherapy. So whenever someone gets immunotherapy and they have their kind of first set or even sometimes two scans, what we can often see is some of the tumors actually increase in size first. And 
the, the thought behind that is that, okay, now you're stimulating the immune system to now recognize this cancer as being foreign. So then you have an influx of actually immune cells into the tumor. Now when we do the, the, the CT scan or PET scan, we see the size gets bigger. We can't tell if that's tumor or if that's inflammation. So a lot of times what we do is we may, um, we may you know, say, okay, if everything's okay, we'll just repeat another scan and continue with the immunotherapy. Now, sometimes certain lesions can respond and certain lesions don't respond. And that's probably related to the different biology of different tumor sites. So we talk about you know, metastatic disease as, oh, there's a lung lesion, there's a liver lesion. In reality, and even probably within the liver, different tumors have a different biology. So it might be that if everything else is responding except one lesion, that it's a good idea to do some local therapy for that. Because then if you're able to control that one lesion, but everything else is still responding, you can keep doing that, that treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just that, so, I'm so to think. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say like in the specific situation, Right. But, but the liver-directed therapy, especially if you're doing cert spears or, or, or TACE, um, it's good at shrinking or treating like one specific lesion. It doesn't treat kind of everything else. So if the, everything else is getting better with the immune therapy or is stable, then it might be that, that one specific area needs to be treated. And another thing too is with radiation or with, um, like radiation or local therapies, um, when they result in kind of some of the tumor cells dying, we think that that actually releases the antigen or the foreign protein from the, from the melanoma. And that your body then might actually have a better immune or a more robust immune response because it's been, the, the number of antigens kind of circulating has, has increased. Now, that's, that's a theory, it's something called the abscopal effect when we talk about it with radiation, um, but, but that may be some of what, what's going on. Okay, so. thanks. Yep. Hi, I'm Hi. Kristen from Philadelphia. And I guess if you could maybe just walk us through, so a patient now has metastatic disease. Mm -hmm. I guess you're doing, obviously you're doing a biopsy, and are you sending that for sampling or genetic testing to then say, okay, do we give you an MEK inhibitor, or do we give you immunotherapy, or do we look at doing liver-directed treatments? So I guess that's what I'm kind of looking for an answer. Yeah. And then, you know, usually your first trial is gonna be your best bet. And then how do we as patients kind of do that? Is that what you're gonna say, hey, here's the NIH registry, here's all these choices, yeah. or wow, I want you to stay at Emory because we need more patients for our trial. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think, to, to be honest, it depends on essentially what trials are available, how willing you are or your family member is to travel to different trials, and then I think it also depends on the clinical situation. So if you have, say, an extremely large liver lesion but no other sites of disease, it might be that liver-directed therapy is the best option at that period of time. But if you say, you know what, I, um, I'm really interested in immune therapy and you may have small sites of disease and you don't want to travel, then I would say, you know what, immune therapy is the best option. But um, regardless of, of what, you, what you decide and what options are available locally, um, the tumor should be, should be tested for genetic testing. That might not affect the treatment right away, because, but that would be useful later on down the road. So for instance, knowing if there is a GNAQ or a GNA11 mutation, that might affect what trials might be available in the future. Or if there are other mutations that um, you know, are not the typical mutations, that might make you eligible for a different trial that's not necessarily just in the uveal melanoma world. So it really depends on the clinical situation. There's not a clear kind of algorithm. Um, I think we always look at what clinical trials are available and always discuss that as a potential with patients, but there's no just one right answer. It really depends on the patient. And I'm sorry, so when you go to the biopsy at Emory, you were sending it out for genetic testing. Uh, we, we do have a panel. Actually, do you, do you want to talk about like the panel that we do for, for melanoma testing um, at Emory? Uh, well, I mean, just to say. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of ways to approach to the genetic testing, and uh, 
A lot of people, I think, send to Foundation One, which does a, a broad array of mutations in that, and that's fine. Uh, what we do at Emory, and, and you comment on what you all do as well, is we have <clears throat> a panel of 26 genes that we look for mutations in. And now that particular panel was chosen for genes that are mutated in melanoma and also in lung cancer, which is another common thing that we see at Emory. It, you know, it's hard to say uh, with data, but increasingly I think you can find that you know, there are advantages to doing in-depth sequencing of a few genes as compared to less in-depth sequencing of multiple genes. You know, and I don't know again your comments, but. Uh, but uh, that's what we've opted to do, to try to focus on a certain number of genes that are known to be mutated in, in melanomas and lung cancer and to do more in depth. Now our next iteration will have more genes in it, uh, same sort of thing, but that's what we do. Uh, I don't know, do you want to comment about? Yeah, I mean, while she's coming up, I mean, I think it's important because I think that's how we're going to learn about more yeah. information. Even if it may not change our first treatment decision, I think it's important for down the road and certainly just to learn more. So. Yeah, so, so we, we typically, um, when we biopsy the liver, um, we try to get as much tissue as possible. Um, uh, some of the patients in the room have been on the receiving end of this discussion. Um, you know, we do send to either Foundation One or Keras. Um, there's a lot of different companies out there that may give a little bit of different information, some of which is genetic information. Um, and I don't know if this is your experience, but um, it's fairly predictable what you get back at eye melanoma. There's actually very few mutations. So I think uh, we talked a little bit before about, you know, you see GNAQ, GNA11. Um, we're starting to see maybe some IFACs in the SF3B1. Um, and these are all things I think that were also explored in the TCGA, that like genome atlas. Other than that, there's not a whole ton that comes back um, that at least has clinical implication at this point. Unlike skin melanoma um, or other cancers um, who have a large mutation load. Um, so we send it off, but again, it's not really changing our management up front. One of the other things we do do with our tumor, um, and again, when you talk about things like Keras or Foundation or a platform just use your institution, there's kind of two separate tests that can be done. So one is kind of gene sequencing, and the other thing is called immunohistochemistry, so stuff that you can stain for. Um, and one of the things kind of based on a lot of the work that's been done in immunotherapy that we've looked at is PDL1 staining or PD1 staining or the presence of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and how that may dictate your treatment. Um, and what we've kind of experienced again is this is another area where eye melanoma is very different than skin melanoma. Um, it doesn't seem to have the same PD1, PDL1 expression. The immune system just doesn't seem to be there, at least in the beginning. Um, so, so we often will do next generation sequencing based on some things and then also the, um, the staining component. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your attention. And I'll be around if you have any other questions.